طلبتنا الأعزاء صباح الخير نتيجة للظروف الحالية اللي يعيشها العراق والعالم بسبب تفشي وباء كورونا الله يبعد عنا إن شاء الله ونفككم الصحة والعافية دائما وحسب توجيهات وزارة التعليم العالي والبحث العلمي من أجل الاستمرار بالتعليم الطبي الإلكتروني واعتماده كوسيلة بديلة عن الحضور إلى الكلية في هذه الفترة راح تكون هذه أول محاضرة الحقيقة أن في respiratory system module about that that contains video recording so I will talk about a very important subject today that is history taking and examination of the respiratory system myself is Dr. Majid Al Aboud uh, endocrinologist and the module lead so uh, taking history is a very important subject and taking history from a patient uh, is uh, one of the major parts of diagnosis of the problem and you need to know and to be able to fully explore common symptoms of respiratory disease and as you know the most common symptoms of respiratory disease are First of all, shortness of breath or dyspnea, uh, chest pains, cough, uh, wheeze, and wheeze, you know, the musical sound that you hear when you listen to the respiration of your patient or when you put your stethoscope on his chest. And then we have sputum production and finally hemoptysis. You know, hemoptysis is blood in the sputum. <clears throat> and remember that these symptoms can also occur in the absence of respiratory disease. For example, a shortness of breath might be seen in a, a patient with a heart failure. Similarly, cough and wheeze might be seen in a patient with heart failure. Likewise, sputum production as well. While a chest pain can be seen in a patient with, uh, for example, myocardial infarction or angina pectoris or any ischemic heart disease or in pleurisy. And hemoptysis might be seen in any patient with a blood uh, or dyscrasia or bleeding disorder. Uh, for example, patient presents with hemoptysis, epistaxis, bleeding under the skin, so generalized ability to bleed. So let's take uh, one of these common symptoms, that is cough. <clears throat> Here you should think about how you can use the mnemonic. As you know, in medicine, in order not to forget the thing, because we cannot keep all the information in our brain for a long period of time so we made mnemonic so a good mnemonic here in respiration is what is called skip tops and this can be applied for all the systems not only only the respiratory system so remember this word uh, skip tops and it can help you to remember the things so, for example, there are many questions that could be asked about cough. And S stands for sight of cough. You know, if the cough is painful, you can ask where the pain is. For example, if the pain is at the periphery with cough, then this is most likely leprosy. Sorry, uh, pleurisy. The Q stands for quality of cough. What does the cough sound like? Is it harsh cough? Okay. Or dry cough? Non productive cough? Or it is barking cough? Or it is weak, barely hear cough? Whether is it productive? which means it contains sputum or nonoproductive that is dry cough all of these questions will help and guide you to reach the correct diagnosis
then I, the letter I, stands for intensity of thought. Is it so intense and severe, so it disruptive to the patient's life? Is there syncope or nerve syncope? And you know, syncope means that the patient is about, is, is fainting. Nerve syncope is mere fainting. So the patient might lose his consciousness. And usually syncope indicates that the cough is intense and severe and prolonged. So these symptoms are important. Then if we go to the third, fourth letter, that is T stands for timing. Timing of cough is very important. Whether it is acute or chronic cough, how long has it been present and a, has it changed over time? You remember a, a, in, in the lecture of bronchial asthma, we said that the patient is coughing when he has occupational asthma, that is asthma related to the job. For example, a patient is working in, in, in a chemical compound, he will be coughing during his work days while he is well when he is in holiday. Uh, you should ask about the letter A, which is aggravating factors, the factors that make cough worse. Uh, for example, damp, damp conditions, humid conditions. You know here in Basra, when the weather is so humid, uh, many patients with bronchial asthma will get worse. Uh, smoking is another aggravating factor, and dust, and there are many, many. Then the R stands for relieving factors. Example, a changing position of the patient a, might a, a relieve cough uh, or a, any cough so, syrup or bronchodilator. You remember one of the things that differentiates a bronchial asthma from COPD is that people with bronchial asthma usually responds well to a, a, a bronchodilator. Uh, P stands for previous episodes. Uh, is there a pattern? Uh, any time of the year uh, it is affected by weather, for example, coughing in, uh, in winter only, or during the day of forecast in occupational asthma. Was it the same or different from this presentation? So it is very important. If it is the same, it means that it is a chronic condition, etc. And this stands for secondary symptoms of uh, associated with cough. For example, you should ask about any pain, any hemoptysis, any shortness of breath. Uh, this is to establish the relationship between these symptoms. And if we take sputum uh, as a second common symptom in the respiratory system, uh, try at home now to use these mnemonic uh, skitabs to consider the types of questions that you could ask your patient about sputum production. Uh, consider why the information might help you to make a diagnosis. And please remember that they will not all be relevant for every symptom. So you may have a uh, skitabs applies for a symptom and doesn't apply all for another symptom. And here I put some figures of people with different colors of sputum, sorry. So uh, this sputum is a frothy, which is pink in color, uh, in color, and it is characteristic of a pulmonary edema, like you can see, frothy sputum. Uh, a pulmonary edema, you know, in patients with heart failure. Well, if it is mucopurulent, that contains like pulse material, uh, it is common in bronchial or pneumonic infection. Likewise, if it is just pus purulent in color, it's characteristic of pneumonia. And finally, if it contains blood or blood citrates, it might indicate 
cancer or tuberculosis or bronchiac disease or even pulmonary embolism. And we've taken the differentiating factors between COPD and asthma in terms of symptoms. And they have usually common shared symptoms, but full exploration of these will reveal characteristic differences. And this is your job at homework to remember the differentiating factors in terms of dyspnea, cough, and sputum between COPD and asthma. Now we finish talking about history taking, which almost should lead you to the diagnosis, but you need to do the examination after history taking. And the respiratory examination should include the following as other, uh, any other system examination. First of all, a general uh, inspection from the end of the bed. So you stand at the end of the bed near the patient's feet and look at the patient. And you should then do general examination of the hands, the pulse, the face, the neck. Examination of the hand is crucial because you might see cyanosis, which is bluish discoloration of the fingers of the patient. This is called peripheral cyanosis, and we have central cyanosis that is peripheral, that is cyanosis of the tongue. And as you can see here in this photo, uh, this is characteristic clubbing of the fingers. So the clubbing is one of the most important, as you can see here, signs of respiratory problem can be seen in lung cancer, for instance or a chronic empyema or pus in the plural cavity we call it empyema so finger clubbing is very important and then we should after finish the general examination we do specific examination of the respiratory system and you know the four pillars or points of examination in general we have inspection palpation percussion and auscultation before you start examining the patient you have to prepare yourself first of all you should wash your hands and then introduce yourself to the patient if you have not already done by saying hi uh, i am a medical student and then my name is blah and then ask the patient's uh, permission to carry out the examination and then give a brief explanation to the patient before you start so that the patient will feel comfortable and will not be terrified for example you say hi my name is dr majid uh, i would like to examine your chest if you don't mind i will first look at your chest then uh, palpate the chest and then do some sort of percussion and then I will use my stethoscope to listen to your chest. This is the proper way of introduction. And uh, of course what you need in terms of equipment is a stethoscope and uh, preferably a peak flow meter and you have seen the peak flow meter if you don't you can search it on Google. Uh, the patient position is very important. Ideally, the patient should be sitting at 45 degrees and, the, uh, and lying in bed. Uh, and in, in female patients, the bra will need to be removed for you to carry out the examination effectively. But remember, do not expose the patient's chest until you are ready to examine though this is sometimes might be difficult in our community but this is the ideal way and then in the general observation uh, as we said you should stand at the feet of the patient at the end of the bed and not any obvious discomfort or pain look at the color of the patient whether he is cyanos or pale and whether he is using accessory muscles 
uh, which indicates that he is uh, short of breath okay accessory muscles like the muscles in the neck or the abdomen uh, also look for any tachypnea that is rapid uh, respiratory rate any audible breathing sounds whether wheezing or strider you know wheezing is the musical sound that we talked about and strider is a characteristic sound uh, which is an inspiratory sound when the patient breathes you will hear like this <gasps> this indicates a problem in the vocal cord usually also note the respiratory rate you should count the respiratory rate for at least 30 seconds and multiply it by two to get the respiratory rate in a minute and then uh, you should look at the surrounding of the bed whether there is oxygen bottle or oxygen mask or any chest drain you know the chest drain is a tube attached to the chest of the patient to drain pus or blood from the pleural cavity uh, any sputum pot a, a, a bowel or that is beside the patient for his sputum to see the color and the characteristic of the sputum look at if there is any uh, inhaler which might indicate that the patient has bronchial asthma or COPD and this is a characteristic feature uh, or facies that we can elicit from general examination and general look of a patient look at this patient he has cyanosis look at the lips this is central cyanosis bluish discoloration of the lips and he is plethoric the, as if he has a very high hemoglobin look at his eyes they are very red his skin uh, this is a plethora because of uh, a polycythemia high hemoglobin in the blood as a result of a chronic hypoxia due to usually COPD so this patient might have COPD examination of the hands is very important first of all you should inspect both hands look at the nails the back and the palms looking for any cyanosis any clubbing and then you should be able to recognize and know the significance of the following things clubbing peripheral cyanosis temperature and tar staining tar staining is characteristic of people who smoke after that you should feel the radial pulse and know the rate how many pulses per minute the rhythm whether they are regular or not and the character of the pulse so uh, for example tachycardia and bounding pulse bounding means a large volume pulse is characteristic of co2 retention and respiratory failure then check for clubbing tremor which again is an indicative sign of co2 retention if appropriate so how to examine for a clubbing tremor you you can go to the youtube uh, and write clubbing tremor examination is very uh, of, there are very uh, clear and useful videos that you can see about flabbing tremor once you see it you will never forget it so ask the patient to stretch the arms out of in front of them with the wrist dorsiflexed and the fingers extended and then you will see the jerky flexion of the at the wrist uh, which indicates a flabbing tremor Clapping just like the pigeon when flying. Okay. Examination of the face is important. Uh, gently pull down the lower eyelids, looking for polycythemia. Inspect uh, for pale conjunctiva of anemia. <clears throat> and ask the patient to open their mouth. Look for central cyanosis. After we finish from the face, we go to the neck. We should check jugular venous pressure, JVP, and the JVP will help us to uh, diagnose the problem as well. People with heart failure will have raised JVP, which usually indicates the right ventricular pressure. 
So with the head resting back on the pillow, ask the patient to turn the head to the left and look for pulsation along the right internal jugular vein to measure JVP. Again, you, get, you can go to YouTube and write down J, JVP examination. There are very useful videos there. After examining for JVP, palpate the neck for any enlarged lymph node. And we have many regions, and I will show you on the next slide. We have occipital at the back of the head, post auricular just behind the uh, ear, pre auricular just in front of the ear, submandibular that is below the mandible, submental which is below the uh, chin, uh, sorry, below the uh, here's the chin. And we have anterior and posterior cervical lymph nodes, and we have supraclavicular lymph nodes. For example, a very important lymph node, we call it scalene lymph node. And the scalene lymph node is a, a very important lymph node because it might indicate the presence of lung cancer, okay, at the uh, region just above the clavicle. So, a uh, scalene nodes examined with the head is slightly tilted to one side, pressed down gently between the clavicle and the sternocleidomastoid toward the first foot. Enlargement might be the first evidence of metastatic lung cancer. Okay, so here is the neck, as you can see here, we have many regions. This is the sternocleidomastoid muscle and uh, the this is the clavicle and usually here we are looking for any scaling lymph node in this region and this is the external jugular vein that we look for when we examine the jvp is very important and these are the regions usually the neck is divided into five regions of lymph node this is the first region in the submandibular area, the second in the upper cervical, middle cervical, and lower cervical, and then the fifth region is the posterior cervical. This is very useful to organize your examination and not to miss any region while you are examining the neck or lymph node. And then we go to the chest, and the chest wall must be examined completely actually with the four elements of examination that we talked about. First, we have to examine from the front and then from the back. And also lymph nodes can be palpated while the patient sits up in between. So sometimes we might examine the lymph node with the general examination before examination of the chest. Sometimes we might postpone lymph node examination when we examine the chest when we turn from the front to the back we might palpate the neck from the back so let's just start with the chest examination we always start with inspection so what we can see with the inspection of course the chest should be exposed and we should look for any abnormalities or deformity like barrel chest or pectus carinatum, pectus excavatum. Pectus carinatum is a deformity where the lower part of the sternum is brought to the outside, while pectus excavatum is the opposite, when the lower part of the sternum is uh, invaginated to the inside. Also, look for Harrison sulci for any kyphosis and scoliosis. I will leave Harrison sulci for you to look for, and this is a homework. Uh, then look for any breathing pattern, uh, any asymmetry of movement of the chest. After inspection, we go to palpation, and in palpation, we palpate for the position of the apex beat. This is important because the apex beat of the heart 
you can diagnose cases of heart failure if it is displaced from its usual position. Then examination for the trachea. We palpate for the trachea and you should first warn the patient it might be uncomfortable and then you should place a finger uh, on either side of the trachea, one on the left, then on the right of the trachea, and judging the space in each side, is it equal? If it is equal, so this is normally centrally located the trachea, or sometimes it might be deviated to one side, probably due to colon cancer or pneumothorax or hemothorax, etc. So the normal trachea is a centrally located trachea. Also, examine for chest expansion. Place the hand around the chest with the thumbs extended and elevated from the chest wall. And after patient, take a deep breath. Then your thumbs will move apart and note the amount of asymmetry of movement. This is very useful. You can go to YouTube and look at the examination of chest expansion. It's very easy. After that, we do percussion. And percussion, we start with the anterior chest. We should start from the clavicle and move from side to side. So right and left. We start from above and then go below. And then we have to exam examine the chest wall uh, from up to down and under the arms. And percussion note produced are either tympanic, which is the normal tympanic, like airdom, and then we have hyperresonant, and that is the sound is very exaggerated, which is seen in hyperinflated chest, like in COPD, and we have dull. Not as if you are examining a solid something solid, so you cannot hear a, the percussion note, and this indicates that there is probably pleural effusion. And uh, each area of the chest wall correlates with different areas of the lungs in both percussion and auscultation. So, anterior wall, we have a uh, I usually the upper lobes, while the posterior wall is for the lower lobes, the right lateral wall for the middle lobe, and the left lateral wall is for the lingual. So a percussion, a, any any problem with percussion in these areas might give you a hint where the pathology is. So the technique of percussion is by placing the left hand flat on the chest wall. Even if you are left-handed, you should put your left hand flat on the chest wall and you should use the middle finger uh, of that left hand firmly pressed against the chest. And then use the middle finger of the right hand and you make it like a hammer and subtract the middle phalanx of the middle finger of the left hand. I've shown you a few months ago the technique of percussion, but you can review it again on YouTube. The striking finger should be moved away again quickly so as not to dampen the sound produced. Movement of the striking hand is from the rest. Remember always, the striking hand, the right hand, should be moved from the wrist, okay, not from the elbow, from the wrist, remember that. So this is a photo how to assess the chest examination. We put the hand like that with the thumbs, and there is space between the thumb, and ask the patient to take full breath, and we notice how much the chest expansion is by noticing the distance between the two thumbs, just right here, okay? And this is the technique of percussion. This is the left hand, middle finger of the left hand is pressed firmly against the chest. And then we use the finger, the middle finger of the right hand, like a hammer, and we 
to track the middle finger of the left hand by our middle finger of the right hand and the movement should be at, at the level of the wrist not the elbow like this one okay and we will hear a sound okay and these are the points of percussion and auscultation of the chest from in the front and from the the back so starting from here to here on both sides so we start here and then here here and here like this so from the one side to one side and then from up to down likewise from the back we start from here to here here to here and so forth and then when you complete the examination you should cover your patient remember you have exposed them and assist to uh, redress if necessary help him to uh, uh, wear his clothes and do not forget to thank your patient always thank him at the end of the examination after that we may do bedside tests like peak flow uh, because you remember you might have peak flow meter with you and uh, check the temperature of course as part of your normal examination inspect the sputum sample if there is a bowel or port containing sputum of the patient and we may do cardiovascular examination if needed when we think about any problem with the heart or the cardiovascular system dear students i hope you enjoyed this lecture i'm ready to answer you and please uh, you can use the youtube to look at in uh, videos uh, that may explain the techniques of exam and hopefully when the when the, we when we resume our meetings we, we might have a clinical sessions and uh, thank you so much and uh, goodbye